from our link diocese and to attend a number of special events, including the consecration of the present Bishop, Bishop Johan Dahlmann. It's been fascinating learning more about our link with Sweden because it's not only an international link, but also an ecumenical link between our Anglican diocese and a Swedish Lutheran diocese. My other international involvement in things Anglican and Lutheran has been as a member of the executive committee of the Anglican Lutheran Society, which is a worldwide group of theologians, church leaders and interchurch families, among others, who are working to bring our two communions closer together. As part of my work with ALS, I helped to organise a major conference at Visby on the Swedish island of Gotland, where Bishop Johan was one of our main speakers. And more about all of that later on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christine. Hello, I'm Christine Knight. Um, my international experience has been in sub-Saharan Africa in Zaire, as was what is now called Democratic Republic of the Congo, in the mid to late 80s, where my husband was working as a medical doctor and I was mostly at home looking after the children. We've recently returned from working in North Africa, where my husband, who's now ordained, was um, rector at an English-speaking church, which had a mix of nationalities in the congregation. Both of these times, we were with uh, CMS, the Church Mission Society, and we greatly valued our links with churches back in the UK. It was good to know that we were being prayed for. In the in-between years, for many years, we were in the Norwich Diocese, which as part of the same Porvo agreement, was linked with Lulio Diocese in the north of Sweden. And, <laughs> and we had quite a lot to do with that link. And in fact, my husband took his sabbatical there and I was able to join him for a bit of that time. In the International Links Committee, I'm the current chairman and I'm on the subcommittee for the Swedish link. Uh, sorry, thank you, Christine. Um, David is next. Hi, right, I'm David Fieldsend. I'm a lay minister in the Camborne cluster. Uh, my international experience has been in East Africa and continental Europe. I returned from Brussels uh, back home to Cornwall a couple of years ago. Last year, Bishop Philip recruited me to work on the Foreign Office report on persecuted Christians overseas and the extent of UK support for them or otherwise. And uh, that's really got, what got me involved with international links here. Um, I serve on the committee and I chair the subgroup on the link with Lebanon, which we'll be talking about later. Thank you, David. And Leslie. Uh, my name is Leslie Booker. Um, I'm the uh, secretary to the International Links Committee. Um, I became involved with what was the originally the World Church Committee uh, in 2008 after I was lucky enough to be able to visit Mzimvubu as part of our uh, the Truro uh, link with the Diocese of Mzimvubu uh, and I've retained an interest um, and contact with uh, people who I met in Mzimvubu at that time and, um, and I'm very pleased to be still part of this committee. Thank you Leslie and Sherry. Hello, I'm Sherry Sturgis. I'm a reader in the parish of Liscard towards the eastern end of uh, Truro Diocese. Um, and uh, my international links experience is limited to um, just two or three visits rather than actually serving uh, abroad at all. Um, particularly with Umzimbubu because I too went out there with my husband in 2008. I think it was a different trip from Leslie's. Um, so I was out there for a couple of weeks with our then Suffragan Bishop, uh, Bishop Roy, and uh, made, made some contacts then. And that was while I was diocesan secretary. Shortly after I left employment with the diocese, I was asked if I would become the treasurer of the World Church Committee um, and sort of maintain that interest with Umzimvubu. And um, Mike and I were actually fortunate enough to visit uh, just over 12 months ago in the autumn of uh, 2019, uh, because my brother-in-law lives now down in Hermanus. Uh, so we were visiting him and having a tour around and we called in at Umzimbubu. We were guests of um, Viani and Phyllis Busso, who I corresponded with a lot um, during my time. And they, were, they showed us around a little bit. We were only there a couple of days, um, but it was good to 
renew that link. Uh, and I, was, I have also visited Strangnas because I was part of a small group that went over there. I think that was back in 1998, just before we actually made that link. So I've also met, visited the cathedral and some of the churches in Strangnas. And that's me. Thank you, Sherry. And last but not least, Etienne. Hello everybody, lovely to be here and thank you for joining us as well. I'm Etienne, I'm priest in charge in Carvers Bay in the Land, uh, St. Union St. Anta Church, uh, since uh, July 2019 uh, when I joined uh, the Truro family. Uh, my international experience, uh, you can hear from my accent, uh, is not from here, uh, South Africa. It started in 1993 when I lived and worked in Lebanon and Jordan for the best part of 10 years and married a Jordanian lady as well, uh, Achlan. <laughs> and uh, we came to Britain in 2002, and I've been a priest in the Church of England for about 10 years. So I work alongside everybody on the committee, but specifically also David, uh, in connection with the Lebanon Link. So um, I hope you enjoy the evening with us. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's all our International Links Committee. We have a, a few other members who couldn't be with us. Um, we're now going to hear from a little bit about each of our diocesan links that we've that various people have mentioned already, but we're going to hear a little bit from each one. Now, first on our agenda is Mzimbuvu. Um, Reverend Simtembile, can you hear us? Okay, so he Reverend Simtembile is from Mzimbuvu and he's been having internet problems all day. He has sent me a short video, which I'll show you in a moment, but first I'm gonna pass over to Sherry. Sherry, if you wouldn't mind filling us in a little bit on uh, Mzimbuvu and, and and where we are now in Mzimbuvu. Okay, well, as I said, I have um, had the privilege of visiting there for a couple of times in 2008 and 2019. Um, so I know a little about um, that particular area of South Africa. And it looks as though we've just lost Reverend Sitchambili again. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know him, actually, uh, so I can't really introduce him as such. Um, I think possibly, Christine, it might be best if we see the video first, and then if I know any other things, I can fill in a bit later. How does that well, sound? Well, having seen the video, would you say a little bit, it, the video is of the Acting Dean blessing food parcels, so perhaps you could say a little okay. bit about the, the project so that we know why he's okay. food parcels. <laughs> um, well, as, as, as I've sort of explained, there's been a link with Mzimbubu um, at least since 2008, probably a couple of years or so before that. Um, and uh, a big sort of funding drive across the diocese to encourage people to donate money because we've seen just what a, a, a poor area of South Africa it is and how many people are in need uh, and the extent of, um, of the suffering with the AIDS pandemic. Um, sorry, pandemic, that's part of our vocabulary now, isn't it? But yeah, but it is a pandemic, isn't it? Um, so an awful lot of orphans, orphan children there, some of them being looked after by grandparents, but without parents. And so over all those years, there've been people across the Diocese of Truro who have been giving regularly um, to, um, uh, I think there have been a handful of projects over the year, but the one that's really kept going is the Orphans and Vulnerable Children project, which was run for many years by Phyllis Busso, who I visited um, just over a year ago. Uh, and uh, for two or three years, there was a very difficult situation in the diocese with the previous bishop, which meant that we weren't really able to send out any funds at that time. But I'm pleased to say that the new bishop who was um, installed there just over 12 months ago um, uh, has managed to um, sort things out an awful lot, uh, particularly with his present diocesan secretary as well. And they have restarted the feeding programme. So we have been able to start just before Christmas resending donations out there. And that I think is probably what you're going to find in the video of, of the food parcels going out. Yeah, so nice. shall I hand back to you then, Christine? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'll show you this little video. I, I'd say because of uh, the internet problems that Reverend Simpson-Bile was having, I only just received it. So I 
looked at bits of it, but it's basically <laughs> showing the acting dean there uh, blessing some of these food parcels that they were able to to provide with the, the funds that came from, from probably many of you who are watching this evening have been involved in providing some of those funds. So I'll attempt to share this video. Hopefully it's going to work. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it's going to be good, I think. Hopefully you can see that. I shall start it playing. <laughs> there in Mzimbuvu. Um, now, I don't know if anybody at this point, if anyone has any questions or comments about Mzimbuvu in particular, um, obviously our speaker hasn't been able to be with us, but Sherry can <laughs> hopefully do her best to answer your questions if anybody has anything. If not, we will, we will move on. Just if you have a question, just pop it in the chat or, or in the question and answer box. I can't see anything at the moment. So is there anything you want to add, Sherry, before we move on? Um, 
Perhaps just to say that, uh, having mentioned the, the AIDS pandemic, of course, we are all of us now in the middle of this coronavirus epidemic, uh, pandemic. And um, I, I know that we in this country are very well aware of this South African variant as well. Um, I, my, my understanding is, uh, and it is only limited, I'm afraid, but that this, this particular area of Umzimbubu being such a poor area is uh, particularly badly hit by it. So, uh, you know, our, our thoughts and prayers do need to stay with them. Yeah, so, so for those of you who are watching us, the way you can get involved with the Mzimbuvu link is to pray. Um, that's really important. If you wish to donate financially, you can do that as well, but please pray. We have a, a section on the website for international links and this link and the others, you can read updates and the things that we need to pray for, um, we, we update that quite regularly. So, so do pray, and if you're interested in, in helping in any way as an individual or as a parish, um, do get in touch. Uh, thank you very much, Sherry. Um, okay, I'm going to pass on to um, Perrin now to introduce uh, Bishop Johan. Well, it's a very great privilege to, to introduce to you my old friend, Bishop Johan Dahlman, the Bishop of Strangness, together with Magdalena, his chaplain. I've known Bishop Johan for many years, even before his time as Dean and then Bishop of our Link Diocese, because his previous position was as the National Ecumenical Officer for the Church of Sweden, in which he played a major part in forging the Porvo Agreement, which has brought about full communion between the Anglican churches of the British Isles and the Lutheran churches throughout Scandinavia and in the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia too. It's very good to have such an important figure on the international ecumenical stage as our link bishop and we welcome our Swedish guests to this webinar and invite them to introduce their diocese and its life. Bishop Johan and Mark Magdalena. Go for it Christine, uh, the film, the film. You're, you're muted, Christine. Sorry about that. Yeah, we have a film that introduces Bishop Johann and Magdalena and another of their colleagues very nicely for them. So I'll, I'll put that up just to warn you. This is a fairly long film. It's about 15 minutes, but it's it's a really lovely film. So sit back and enjoy. If it works, let me try. <laughs> oh, hold on a moment. My emails are popping up. Right. Let me try again. Share screen, here we go. Good evening, dear Truro friends, and welcome to uh, my home, to the library in the bishopric of the Diocese of Strengnes. It's not a bishop behind my back, it's actually a painting I bought when I got my first student loan, silly of me, but I like the picture. Well, the Diocese of Strengnes and the Diocese of Truro, we're twinned together since um, 20 years, over 20 or, or about 20 years now. How come? Well, it all actually began when, when the Porvo Agreement was fairly new in the 1990s. And my predecessor, by but one, Bishop Jonas Johnson, together with all the bishops of the Church of Sweden, uh, had a retreat in Lincolnshire, and uh, which was led by a charismatic uh, bishop, the bishop, uh, the then bishop of Grantham, Bishop Bill Ind. So when Bishop Bill was uh, translated to um, Truro. Uh, my pre -pre predecessor, Bishop Jonas, uh, uh, enjoyed the, the friendship of Bishop Bill. And so when Bishop Bill came to Truro, well, Strengness came as well, only a few years later. Now, the rest is actually just a fabulous, wonderful, a happy story of us being together. Um, our 
such a lot of things have has happened throughout the years. I mean, we have had parish parishes meeting parishes. Uh, uh, lots of us have been to to Truro over and over again, and a number of you have been to Sweden over and over again. Choirs have met choirs, youth groups have met youth groups. Our diocesan council have been to Truro. Um, uh, your cathedral choir, uh, the bu- fabulous, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious cathedral choir of the Cathedral of Truro has been to Strangness when I was the cathedral dean. Um, our now the, the dean of the of the cathedral now, Bishop uh, Dean Christopher, when he was a young man, he he uh, I think he did two summers with you uh, in Truro. Uh, and I, together with my chaplain Magdalena, I had the great privilege and joy to be part of uh, the uh, enthronement of Bishop Philip only a few years ago. Well, only to mention a few, a fraction of all that, what we've been through uh, since we, our twinning began. Some of you already know our diocese uh, with its 900 years, 900 plus years actually, uh, which makes us one of the more senior uh, dioceses of the Church of Sweden. We are well connected in the respect that we are well placed in Sweden, uh, in the vicinity of Stockholm, the the capital, uh, uh, Stockholm, or 50% of uh, Stockholm, the Diocese of Stockholm used to belong to the Diocese of Strängles until the 1940s actually. Uh, and we are we call ourselves the most neighborly diocese in the whole of the Church of Sweden, and that is because seven of uh, the other 13 dioceses in the Church of Sweden uh, are, are our neighbors. So they are surround they surround us. Uh, in in uh, in uh, geographical and uh, demographical demographical terms. We are a diverse diocese with the large cities, uh, two university cities, uh, and, uh, s- and suburbs uh, with lots of immigration and a lot, a lot of uh, rural communities as well. If you look at the map of our diocese, you will see that the Lake Mälaren. Uh, uh, really plays a significant uh, part of our, it's sort of significant when you look at our map. And that is, uh, of course, why we are formed as we are. If you go in one direction, one direction on, our, on the lake, you, go to, you end up in Stockholm and then out into the sea. And if you go to in the other direction, you can go through uh, lakes and, and other waterways uh, to the other side of Sweden. So uh, Strängnäs has always been very centrally placed. Uh, the tradition uh, demographically is that, of course, the part of our diocese which is nearest to Stockholm used to be d- dominated by large estates, uh, great landowners, uh, and uh, f- uh, farmers working under those in those sort of in those communities. Whereas in the other side of the diocese, there were more smallholders or, or large farmer, large larger farms. They own themselves or, or uh, lots of uh, industry. Uh, so the, the sort of spiritual life of our diocese is fairly diverse or used to be fairly diverse, more diverse than it is today, with more of a sort of middle of the road or uh, slightly Catholic uh, strand nearer to Stockholm and more low church, uh, free church uh, touch on the other side of the diocese. But that is really not no long not, not no longer true uh, i mean we are said to be one of them placed in one of the more, more secularized uh, uh, parts of sweden and sweden in itself is uh, coined as one of the most secularized societies in the world i'm not sure that is true but uh, it is the way sociologists say someone else will be able to give you all the exact figures but uh, approximately 370,000 out of 665,000 inhabitants 
in our part of the country belong to the Church of Sweden. So 370,000 members of the Church of Sweden in our diocese. We have 73 parishes. We have 190 priests and uh, 75 permanent deacons. And of course, a lot of retired clergy as well. So those are the in active service, the 190 and 75. It's a lively diocese. Um, Size-wise, we think of ourselves as uh, as uh, big enough to be dynamic, and as I said, we are quite diverse, and small enough to be able, technically anyway, to know each other by first name. Our cathedral city, Strengines, uh, is uh, beautifully placed by, at, by the Lake Mälaren. It's a sm tiny, tiny city, beautiful little cosy, idyllic city with a beautiful, beautiful cathedral, uh, which I and many would say is one of the most beautiful cathedrals in the country. It is very well preserved. It has not been destroyed through uh, the, all the sort of the renovations. It's been very, it, it's very well kept. And uh, on a Sunday when it's not uh, a pandemic or pandemic, of course, lots of people uh, come to the uh, worship, uh, worship there and throughout the week, of course. Uh, and the bishopric, which is uh, just a few uh, stone throws away from the cathedral, is beautiful, substantial. Uh, from the 1640s. It's a privilege to, to live in such a beautiful, beautiful and cosy house. Uh, uh, and the offices of the um, diocese, diocese office, it's, we are housed in a, two uh, uh, buildings just close by, nearby the, the cathedral. And they are old. They are, one of them is actually medieval and one is from the 18th century. Uh, we re we truly treasure our link with you. Uh, you've taught us a lot throughout the years. You have encouraged our ministry. And as you know, we pray for you every single week throughout the diocese. Uh, we uh, we sh cherish uh, our relationship with you and we are happy to... to uh, develop that further. Of course, any twinning uh, is bound to, the intensity of any twinning is bound to differ over time. That's only natural, and especially now when it's, uh, we have the pandemic, of course we have no opportunity to, to visit each other, but there are, times will change and soon we'll be able to, to come together uh, in, re, in real life. Uh, and we have lots of things on our uh, plate uh, our, our common, our shared plate. Uh, we've spoken about youth work, we've spoken about uh, uh, church music, choirs, we've spoken about leadership, uh, we've spoken about um, uh, people, uh, sort of volunteers, uh, we're talking about environmental issues, well, lots and lots of things which we are keen on, on uh, you are keen on and we are keen on and uh, we are even keener together. So, uh, uh, we are uh, hoping to see you soon. Now, I know that my chaplain, Magdalena, and, and uh, Anne, uh, one of, uh, of my dear um, colleagues, are keen to say some, a few words to you as well, uh, because they are our contacts persons, just as Perrin is a cherished and... and uh, and a greatly loved contact person from your side of the, uh, as uh, Evelyn War said, uh, Herring Pond. So, over to you, uh, 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 Magdalena and Anne. Hello, friends in the Diocese of Truro. I am Magdalena, Bishop Johann's chaplain and I am also, together with Anne, that you will meet in a little while, working with our international relations and partnership dioceses. And you are one of those. I had 
the great pleasure of being present in the Cathedral of Truro on the enthronement of Bishop Philip. It was really a great joy to be a part of this festive occasion. But it was also a really great joy to meet you, our friends in Truro. And I really hope that when the pandemic is over, that we will meet again. You may come to us and we may come to you because it is so important that we keep our friendship and relationship alive. We want to get to know you even better and we want to learn from you and we want to be together in prayer. And as they would say in another of our partnership diocese, the Northwestern Diocese of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Tanzania. Tutaonana tena mungu akipenda. We will meet again if God wants. Hello, dear friends in Truro. My name is Anne Falk and I work for the Diocese of Strängnäs. I work together with Magdalena, whom you've met, to uphold and develop our international relationships with dioceses around the world. I also work to support and promote uh, other international contacts as well as international mission and diaconia in our congregations. I know from both personal and previous work experience that contacts with people and churches around the world is important for us not only as individuals but also as churches. When we share and learn from each other, when we talk about faith and everyday life with each other, we can uh, see things from new angles and develop both as people and as churches and we become a worldwide church. And this is why I think it's so important for us to continue uh, to have this relationship and to develop it and to meet both via digital means and in real life when the circumstances allow us again. And of course, I look forward to the day when I can visit Truro and meet you all and uh, see for myself all the beauty that people talk about. I also uh, long for the day when I can greet you here in Stengnes. Until then, I wish you all the best and stay safe. Thank you. Well, friends, after having seen that film, I feel that as I, I have given uh, a filibuster a face, it was a very long film. I'm sorry for the, the, the film, but I'm sure that you, I would want to show you more of the diocese and, uh, and more of sort of where we work and, and tell you a bit more about our spiritual life. It was much, a lot about organization and that is fairly unimportant, but I, I must underline how much we appreciate, how much you, you value your friendship, uh, really, uh, and, uh, and Perrin as our the, the, the standard bearer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop Johan, and, and thank you very much, Magdalena, too, and, uh, and send our greetings to your colleague, Anna, as well. Um, now, I, I see there's a few questions. Let me just have a look. Um, so there's a question here uh, for Bishop Johan or, or Magdalena. Um, it would be very encouraging to hear examples of what the church in Sweden has learned from us and vice versa. So, and maybe for Perrin as well. So this question, Bishop Johan or, or Magdalena or Perrin, um, what have you learned from each other? Uh, I think, uh, first of all, I mean, we have been, we are, uh, in a way, we have been a state church until the year 2000, which has meant that we've had, we, ha we have a lot of employees, we have strong financial status, 
uh, our churches are well kept uh, and uh, we have fostered a tradition where we are seen as state officials in some respect. I mean, that is uh, and only a few years ago, 100% of the Swedes belonged to the Church of Sweden. Everyone belonged to the Church of Sweden. Uh, so then when we talk about um, uh, it's really being a congregation where people uh, volunteer and when we work in different committees and we have different tasks and when we have different leadership roles outside of the organization that is something which we through you have seen uh, uh, in honest uh, uh, and been sort of revitalized and i mean the church of sweden today and the church of sweden 20 years ago is uh, uh, fairly changed because we have now moved away from the state situation we are now down to 60 percent of the Swedes are members. So we have a, a totally new situation. Uh, and that is certainly something we have been seeing you, uh, uh, what everybody in the, in the parish has to, to, to do their bit uh, and how you encourage each other and you, have, you, you uh, foster each other and, and therefore, and all those things. I think that is some, something we have seen. A lot of our congregations have come back and said, this is how we would like to develop our parishes. This is the, the way we feel that a, a lively parish should be. Uh, Magdalena, would you say something? You'd like to say something? Yes, I would. Um, uh, maybe it's personal for me, but I think I will speak for some other people in our diocese. It's um, uh, when, when I visited Truro uh, at the enthronement of Bishop Philip, I was so overwhelmed by the liturgy in your uh, services. Uh, it was, um, uh, uh, it, it got me thinking of, of how a rich liturgy uh, is, um, is so important uh, to, um, to make a good service, if I may say uh, something like that. I really enjoyed it and I felt that like, um, um, well, I felt so much a part of it, although I didn't know it. Uh, it, it was so uh, welcoming for, for someone who didn't know one. And I think that is something that we may learn a lot from uh, in the Church of Sweden, uh, from, from uh, the Anglican Church. When Bishop Tim came to, uh, to, to Sweden a few years ago, he brought along this, um, your um, uh, little uh, sort of memoranda of uh, how to be a lively Christian, it wasn't called that, steps on something. You remember it, something you produced a few years ago. Uh, which we translated into Swedish and we sent out to everybody and which was much loved. We, you know, we have a few priests, we have at least, uh, I think we have two clergy who come from the Diocese of Truro originally and how now, who are now uh, church, priests in the Church of Sweden. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and that was a great encouragement as well. I think from our side, uh, we've, we've learned a huge amount. We've learned how similar we are actually, which is encouraging too. Uh, but uh, two things perhaps stand out for me. One is the, the importance of the, the diaconate um, deacons, permanent deacons, which are a major, major part of the way the Church of Sweden operates, uh, it, working often with statutory bodies as well, uh, thoroughly integrated into, into the social life of its community with, with a distinctive role, which is different some, from, from our permanent deacons often, which we don't have that same kind of role. Uh, which, uh, the other thing is partly through the Swedish Church's strong uh, tradition of, of confirmation, is uh, the, the wealth of materials uh, which they have in, in terms of uh, the catechumenate uh, pedagogy for, for young for children right through, uh, much of which I think would be very good for us to use. It doesn't come from a party line. That's the other thing. There's a kind of integration between Catholic and Evangelical in Swedish material, which we sometimes don't get. We tend to be a bit more polarised, I think. So all of that, I think we've learned quite a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if I can just uh, finish this section with a, a comment. I see there's a comment in the chat box. I, I don't know whether others have seen it from Bishop Philip. He, he just says, thank you, Bishop Johan, Magdalena and Anna for communicating with us with such a care and warmth, we delight in our partnership with you. So thank you, thank you both. Um, and please send our greetings back to Sweden. Um, now we, we have a, a question that's come in, uh, going back to Umzimbuvu now, um, which Sherry has said she's happy to, to answer. 
Um, so uh, the question says, it is a sad truth that corruption is a major problem in churches, certainly in parts of Africa. What policies are in place to minimise the temptation to seal what is meant for the poor? OK, well, I'll, I'll have a go at that. Uh, um, we became uh, we became conscious that there were problems uh, in Omzimbubu quite a few years ago um, and became, started to become quite cautious as to how much money we were sending out and how often. Um, certainly, I was getting uh, reports from them, usually about every quarter or every six months, and photos that actually so, sort of proved that parcels were at least being bought and hopefully being distributed as well. Um, but when we started to get worried, we actually put a halt on sending the money out because uh, I, I mentioned Phyllis Busso, who had been involved in running the project and this was taken away from her and I and, and the committee started to lose confidence in what was happening over there and and the report stopped coming in so we stopped sending the donations reluctantly I have to say but felt that it was safer in our bank account than not knowing where it was going um, but as I say under the, um, the new bishop uh, we are feeling uh, much more confident that he has got a grips of, grip on things. He emails me um, occasionally and I can hear the right sort of language coming through. Um, since we resumed um, sending out donations in about, I think it was November the first one, or it might have been October, uh, I re I've received uh, a couple of reports on how they've structured the distribution into the different archdeaconries and the people that they've appointed to do that. And again, there have been photos, and I mean, just seeing the video today <clears throat> of the blessing of the parcels uh, starts to inspire confidence. But I know that the committee and uh, Bishop Philip are very keen that we do work on some policies uh, to put in place to, um, to, to ensure that we do know how the money is being used and that it is going to the people that we're intending to support. So it's a bit of a work in progress, but we are very conscious of the need to do that. Thank you very much, Sherry. OK, I'd like to move on now. Um, I'm going to hand over to David. David, you're on mute. David, you're muted. David, you're muted. I'm very sorry. Get the screen <laughs> okay. share up. And it wouldn't let me unmute myself after I got there. <laughs> so we'll, we'll try again. Okay. Yeah. Before we go to Lebanon, I've been asked to say a few words about this place. This is my favourite monastery in all the world. It's the Abbey of Londevenac on the Crozon Peninsula in Brittany. And those of you who think quickly may think that name sounds familiar. Well, that is because there is also a place called Landewednac on the Lizard Peninsula in Cornwall. And it's no accident they're so similar because both parishes are dedicated to the same 5th century Celtic saint known as Gwenole in Brittany and Wynwallow in Cornwall. Going back to the 1980s, uh, it was actually a Baptist pastor in Truro who visited this monastery on a sabbatical to use their library to research the history of Celtic Christianity. But started interest in Cornwall in having links with this abbey and restoring, if you like, the links between our two countries that uh, were so close in Celtic times. So many places on both sides of the channel in Brittany and Cornwall that are named after the same Celtic saints. And since the 1980s, there's been regular pilgrimages uh, going from Cornwall to the Abbey at Londovenac. Uh, they're now under the, uh, under the auspices of Churches Together in Cornwall, and you will find more about that on their website. There's youth pilgrimages, pilgrimages just for ordinary Christians, and church leaders 
sort of pilgrimages and retreats where they uh, take counsel and pray together. Right, I'll stop sharing that if I can, if I can find the uh, right button. Right at the top. Right at the top. Well, it's it's, it's disappeared from the top of my screen. <laughs> I'm not having much luck today. There must be some way of getting out of this. Oh, maybe I just... Can you unshare it for me, for me from your end? Great. Oh, no, it's... Okay, that should have stopped sharing. Good. Right. Okay. Trouble is, as soon as I um, take the cursor off, I can't see you, but I will talk whether I can. Okay, we can see you. Great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, the, uh, the Abbey at Londovenac was founded by St. Gwenelay in 485 AD. But our links with Lebanon go back to at least 1000 BC. When uh, Cornwall was trading tin with the Phoenicians and receiving lots of lovely goods from the Middle East in return. And it was also cultural exchanges. And the, the Celtic Christianity that we had in Cornwall was very much influenced from the East and the Orthodox tradition and the, the hermits in the desert and all sorts like that. But nowadays, under Bishop Phillips' um, guidance, we're trying to revive those links um, between the churches in Cornwall and the churches in Lebanon. They're going through a particular time of crisis at the moment. I could go on about it at length, but I think it would be much better to hand over to our Lebanese friend, <laughs> Nabil, Nabil Shahadi, who is coordinator for Alpha for the Levant, which is the wider area of the Middle East, including Lebanon. And he can tell you more about their situation, what we need to pray for, um, what's been done with the, the funds we sent out to Resurrection Church. It's up to him exactly what he wants to say. Over to you, Nabil. Thank you, David. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Uh, having lived myself in the in the middle uh, in England for 30 years nearly, Cornwall was a favorite place uh, for family holidays. So I feel a greater connection uh, with Cornwall uh, than just the historic one that you've spoken about. But that historic connection is really really special, and. Um, and I, I think it's very difficult to start to describe the many crises that uh, Lebanon is going through. Uh, my brother, who's a, uh, a researcher on Middle East issues, when he starts talking about Lebanon, he says, if, you, if somebody gives you a lecture about Lebanon and you understand what they're saying, they don't know what they're talking about because that should, should, should leave you very confused because it is a very confused and <laughs> crazy place. I and mean, at the moment, the crises are on every level, economic, political, COVID, social, and, and we could go on and on. Uh, but of course, one of the biggest reasons to bring Lebanon uh, into the news uh, in the last few months was the big explosion that happened in the port area on the 4th of August, which I, I think somebody has measured as the, the third largest explosion in an urban setting after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So that gives you an idea of the devastation and the scale of um, that uh, explosion, which left 300,000 people homeless, 200 people killed, and 6,000 injured. Uh, so we could go on, but I, I think I'd, I'd like to start by showing you one of one, that a little video of uh, that uh, 
the Resurrection Church, which David mentioned, and I want to thank David for his uh, very faithful journeying alongside us in terms of getting news of Lebanon and sending you the prayer updates. And of course, a, I want to shout out to my ex-boss, uh, Bishop Philip, who was, of course, as you know, uh, head of CMS, and I am a, a CMS missionary as well as a mission partner. And so uh, the partnership with uh, Resurrection Church Beirut uh, is, is a very uh, fruitful one because they're a very active church. It's one of the most strategic churches in the Middle East. My work as Alpha Coordinator puts me in touch with Catholic, Orthodox, and Evangelical. And as uh, David mentioned, serving in the Levant area, which is Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, you know, all the quiet places in the world. And so it's a pleasure to introduce you to the mission of uh, RCB, Resurrection Church, that were, has a very holistic approach to mission. It's not just about evangelism and preaching. It's also about being alongside people and their need and seeing community transformation through the, the, the church being salt and light. And of course, the, the explosion on the 1st of August, on the 4th of August, gave a lot of reason for the church to be involved on the ground. So this is a short video of two minutes about RCB's um, efforts post-explosion. Okay, I shall share that for you. هلو أنا اسمي جوني من كنيسة القيامة نحن بكنيسة المخلص حبينا نجي نساعد أصحابنا هون At the second day of the explosion we were on the streets and we were able to mobilize and arrange teams to go and help out in cleaning the houses which were highly impacted by the explosion and also we distributed food and beverages for the families who have been affected speaks more powerfully than words. We really thank you for coming the day after the explosion with a team of 15 people to help us cleaning and rearranging our apartment. Your financial support was extremely generous. God bless you all. We're able to do what we're doing because of your love and care. We're able to serve and to bring hope to the hopeless because of your trust, because of who you are, and because of this amazing collaboration between the family of God. Thank you so much and God bless you. you a bit of an idea and I know would you like to open it to questions or anything else David you'd like us to yeah, talk about okay. of course one of the saddest things about crazy corona world is that we were all meant to be in Beirut this month yes uh, Bishop Philip and yourself delegation and for you for Bishop Philip to give a talk at uh, the Middle East Council of Churches about the report for our persecuted Christians. And I hope that is postponed rather than canceled. And 
and for the pleasure of seeing you there in Beirut, uh, hopefully. I know you'll think it's impossible from what you said earlier, but could you try and get a few words just to sort of scratch the surface of the economic and political crisis as well the country is suffering? Right, well, let's see some statistics. Uh, Lebanon is now in second place after Venezuela, as far as inflation is concerned. So uh, uh, the devaluation of the currency is an eightfold. Uh, so, you know, uh, with high inflation and huge devaluation in the, uh, of uh, the currency, you can imagine the impact on people's spending power. Poverty is easily above uh, 50 percent, possibly up to you know, 80 you percent know, of, of the population can be seen as in, in, a, in a, some level of poverty uh, in terms of able to meet their daily needs. And on top of all that is, as, as you might have heard, uh, if a great failure of the political uh, leadership in getting the country on its uh, feet in terms of infrastructure and uh, all the basics that make for a bit of a functioning country. There's been a collapse in the banking system due to corruption. And so there's been capital control, where that, which means people cannot, cannot take their money out of the bank, uh, especially if it's in dollars. And uh, you know, it's a, the, the whole Lebanese economy is a trading economy, you know, all the way back to the Phoenicians. So for a country that is based on trade, on import, export, on you know, relationships with, with international banks, to, to be you know, totally frozen uh, in its uh, economic activity is just unbelievably tragic uh, in, uh, for, for the country, let alone you know, being able to bring money in from abroad. Uh, the COVID situation is spiraling. It's out of, almost out of control. The Lebanese government in its ineptitude is only just starting to talk about putting in the order for the vaccination. Um, and the politicians are still haggling over power. The discredited pop politicians who have been part of the ruling mafia for 30 years since the civil war you know, there are no words to describe the failure of leadership and the greed that has governed the way Lebanon has, has been led uh, in the last 30 years, let alone previously. But um, it's, it's tragic. It's, a, it's an amazing country, God's own country, the, the cedar tree, <laughs> as, as the Psalms say, planted by the Lord. Uh, as a symbol also of righteousness, uh, as in the, the Psalms. And so a beautiful country with huge history, you know, it boasts mountains, snow-clad mountains and beautiful beaches, but totally mismanaged, collapsing in many, many, many ways. So your prayers are really coveted and thank you again for being alongside. And I hope Lebanon in its diversity and in the midst of all this, can show that communities can coexist. You know, we have 18 different uh, religious communities, from Muslim, Christian, Jewish. Uh, there is a huge, huge wealth of culture and history that Lebanon offers, as well as all the historic churches that one can get to know. You know, the things that you study about in church history, they're still there the churches that one reads about and I have the privilege of visiting and working with. It's a country where Christians are free. Excuse me? It's a country where Christians are free to be Christians. Absolutely, and that's very much its unique, unique uh, position in, in the Middle East. It's the only Arab country with you know, Christian leadership in terms of the president is always a Christian. That's part of the arrangement between the communities to power share. It's a country where the church is fully free to exist and to function, and to be overtly present and to preach and to convert. So uh, Lebanon is historically a base for mission for the Middle East. 
This was recognized by Pope John Paul II after the Civil War, where he uh, arranged for a whole synod to be about Lebanon, to study uh, the mission and the vision of the church in Lebanon. He asked the whole, the, all the Catholic churches to do a whole year's Bible study. Who are we and what are we doing? Because he recognized that Lebanon has a unique role uh, for the, in the Middle East, not just as an example of reconciliation and coexistence, but also as a mission base. And Pope Benedict, as well as Pope John Paul, visited Lebanon and had open air masses. And Pope Benedict uh, actually gave his commissioning or evangelism and mission to all the church leaders right there in Beirut. So yes, it is in that way, you know, a very special patch for ministry to the Middle East. You say that this crisis is bringing people uh, more together, or is it uh, pe uh, pulling people and apart? And is there a new movement among uh, sort of a, a people coming together to change this system, or is yes, it yes. Th thank you, Bishop Johan. That that is one of the most exciting things that has happened. Uh, since October 2019 is what's called the, the Lebanon Revolution, where people have gone on the streets from all denominations, all united in saying enough is enough. You know, we don't want this uh, corrupt ruling class uh, to be you know, sucking this country dry anymore. And it's, it's been a really, really exciting and creative and united expression of uh, a people saying let us live and stop <laughs> sucking uh, this country dry I and mean, unfortunately we have a ruling class that is very resilient because they they're not going to give up power easily so far it's been a peaceful revolution it's been very creative in its approach but i don't know if you've seen recently there's been some you know once in a while there's been some violence of, out of frustration of seeing nothing happening. I mean, there's, there's been resignation of two governments in response to uh, the protests, but uh, politicians are still haggling over power, even as we speak, and not coming to any proper solution. So there is hope because civil society is mobilized and it's very creative. Yes, I, it would be fair to say it's not just been protests, there's also been practical help for those who've been affected by the explosion and so on. They've Absolutely. Been moving Absolutely. in where the government hasn't gone. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I, I mean, all, most of the response to the explosion has been through civil society and churches. I mean, they just people flooded down you know, onto the streets and started cleaning and uh, repairing. As you saw, RCB was one of those uh, churches, organizations, because the government had, did very little. And it's it's just been unbelievable to see, uh, on one hand, the beauty of the solidarity uh, that's expressed uh, by all these civil society groups and uh, churches, and the inefficiency and uh, you know, ineptitude and impotence of the government. They're still talking about distributing aid <laughs> to, to families from the six explosion which happened six months ago. Tomorrow is the six month anniversary. And they promised uh, an investigation in five days. We still don't have an investigation properly you know, carried out about the explosion. It's, uh, it's a tragic thing on, the, on one hand, but as you say, there is beauty in the midst of the ashes and that's the resilience and the hope that people are holding on to, to try to rebuild a country that has been shattered. Okay, thank you very much, Nabil. It's, um, I think our time is uh, running out now, but thank you for that. And there's a lot for us to pray for there. So thank you please let's remember remember Lebanon and the Resurrection Church in our in our prayers. And the um, truth there's, mission. There's a Sorry? question in chat. There's a question in chat about yeah, ministry. We, there's a couple of questions, but I'm afraid we're we're out of time oh, really. Okay. Um, there are a couple of questions. I'll try and follow up on them later. I'll I'll email the relevant people for those questions and try and 
get the answers for them. I, I will be sending out a follow up email to everyone who is here um, uh, showing you where to find updates for prayer on our website. I'll give you some links to that. There will be a recording of this webinar as well. Um, unfortunately, I started a bit late, but it was only me that got missed off. So all the important stuff is there. So, <laughs> so uh, there will be a recording which will be posted on the website. But thank you That's again. Yeah, yeah go quick, ahead. If you Google Resurrection Church Beirut, you'll see their ministry to Syrian refugees. And there's a huge amount to talk about there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Nabil. Thank you, Bishop Johan and Magdalena. It's been lovely to have you all with us. And uh, we hope to meet with you again soon. Before we finish, uh, perhaps Etienne, could I ask you just to close with a, a short prayer? Will do. Thank you very much. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your presence all over the world um, in our lives and the lives of all Christians everywhere. And we thank you for these uh, ties and links and friendships we have with all the people who visited us tonight as well. We thank you for everybody present here. And we ask that you will continue to do your work in us and through us and around us. And especially also in Lebanon and Sweden and South Africa and in Zimbabwe and uh, also in Britain. And we ask, Lord, that you will bless us and keep us as we part tonight. And as we wake up tomorrow again with the sun of righteousness shining out. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much and, and good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank good you. Night. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you, Etienne. And God bless. <laughs>